I have pretty big latency, but oh no, you're fine. good. You seem <laughs> uh you seem to have low latency from this perspective. Um cool. But we'll see. <laughs> uh uh if you start clipping out of your box or whatever, then I'll realize, okay, you know, Dominic is either hacking or he has ping issues. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> um now Dominic, you brought up a really great uh um point. I asked a question about uh from the security perspective, is there anything that people that are performing code reviews should be aware of? And you brought up dependencies. And that's a really um and and you you also mentioned that that's something we've talked about before, and yeah, that ends up being recurringly a the kind of MRs that introduce new dependencies, um, make people feel feel different feelings. Even like even in comparison to MRs that introduce like a thousand lines of code have changed. Like a new yeah. dependency is like i don't even know how many lines of runtime code this is changing like like there's so yeah. much known that um someone who cares about the product can be concerned about so i'd love to um you dived into how uh some flags for what and that's my big question to you would be what is like a good litmus test for adding a new dependency of knowing is this pretty good and is the like maturity of the project and the maturity of the release like is do like we as GitLab do we tend to want to use the hottest release stuff or do we wait a bit of time to see if security stuff bubbles up from the releases and from the security perspective what's the good litmus test for like adding new dependencies? Yeah. Also, hello Anna. Someone someone else joined us. <laughs> Hi, Anna. Uh. Yeah, I, we we definitely want to use the latest version. Um, there is, of course, a stability and even a security risk, I guess, to being super cutting edge. But chances are that they're fixing security issues. And unfortunately, uh, very few people are as open and transparent as we are with security issues. And they will silently patch everything. So that is a... Because a new version does not mention a security fix does not mean there is no security fix. Oh wow! Unfortunately, so so many many companies don't. Well, companies yes, but even less so. Like small, like benevolent dictators for life don't require don't request CVs. <laughs> they don't request CVs, and especially not for lower severity issues. A lot of. Uh, a lot of companies and groups only request CVs for super critical stuff. Mm -hmm. But what if that low severity issue is just used in a specific condition at GitLab that makes it super critical? So, so we want to have the latest versions. Uh, we're looking for activity in the in, in the dependency. We do have one dependency. Uh, it's one of our wiki rendering ones. It hasn't been updated in like 11 years, I think. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. And <laughs> so so we have some stuff like that. Uh, so you want some sort of activity. And once again, like those are open source projects. And one day that person might decide, I'm not maintaining this anymore. So it's ideally this would be a kind of ongoing process where like we have some sort of monitoring over that and but right now the best we can do as a code reviewer is to look is this being maintained now so like any commits any if it's a gem you go on ruby gems like how what does the release cycle look like oh yeah that's interesting and wow i i prefer from the security side a gem that has like one purpose and does almost only that um or sometimes like rails and stuff like that. you have those frameworks out there but if you like come on an xml parser nokogiri does that it does other stuff but it's like it's pretty just a tool for that job sometimes you have gems that just do so many things and it allows you to pivot in like a hacker that finds a a certain vulnerability could use a feature of that gem that we don't use but it's there and it's used to increase the severity of the 
of the of the vulnerability. It happened with uh, another server-side rendering thing. I think it was for the wikis again, but like some sort of CSS server-side parsing ended up an arbitrary file read. <laughs> like, why did this read files? <laughs> so, so, yeah. so like the person is like, yeah, I'm just doing this CSS file sheet and here's your secrets the rb file <laughs> yeah that sounds like so, yeah you want to avoid that that sounds like using just a subset of a dependency um, yeah so, so there's using it the blast rate but also of something that goes wrong is like you're you're still coupled to a lot of other pieces that could that's interesting that's interesting yeah and sometimes that's a choice. Like that's not really a choice. Like we have this thing we want to do, and there's basically only one well-known gem that does it, um, and we can't really do the feature from scratch ourselves. So it's like, eh, we have to do that. So I, I got to ask you another question. Um, is there ever a situation where it makes more sense? Say the library is small enough where it's basically left pad. That's that's the question. Is I'm asking is where is that line of Okay, this yeah. is open source. We should just we should just create a function using the same code versus we should actually have a third party dependency for this. Yeah. I wish I had a good metric. I know these are million right dollar now, questions. Right now I would say <laughs> right now I would say it's really just by feeling and yeah. Yeah, it's really when we but got a, from the reviewer perspective, especially like AppSec, we have like varying developer experience. I've been a developer for a long time, but not all of us have. And some like, I think I have a decent feeling for how long something would take for us to, to implement. Sometimes we don't. So I think it's just a conversation to have like, yeah, I get that adding this dependency is literal 15 seconds. But here are the things like the, the maintenance we pick up in the long term, like yeah. what happens if we don't update and there's a package, the person gives up maintaining maintaining this and just knowing all these facts, you as a developer adding this dependency, how do you feel about that? Like, is that a good trade-off? <laughs> so if um, if someone's reviewing something and they get that feeling of like, uh, this dependency doesn't have a lot of activity on it. It's not, doesn't seem like it has a lot of signs for like longevity support, but it has a function that we really need. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you, what do you think is a way someone that's reviewing an MR, how they could, how they should respond to that feeling, like reaching out to the MR author or reaching out to maintainers or reaching out to security of like what our, Oh, I think the discussion should happen in the MR, uh, just just with the author. And I, I think every time I've needed to have this conversation, it just worked out in the MR pretty well. Yeah. And sometimes uh, if, it's, if it's just like a specific function inside a package that does way too much, we could, like there are, depending on the licensing and everything, we could extract that and maybe forking is the solution i don't think we've had to well we we did have to fork in the past but maybe not for that reason but uh, like just fork and basically delete everything we don't need that could be a way forward so it has its drawbacks because if yeah. if yeah. like we might miss updates to do upstream and everything it's a uh, it's complicated <laughs> uh yeah and yeah. especially well, I, another sign, I guess, something I would push towards the re-implement ourself, always going back to that left pad, like left pad wasn't just something simple done as a package. It it pulled a bunch of dependencies too. Like why? So so it was like you, you get that huge tree of dependencies. So and you need to care for those as well. Mm -hmm. And nowadays it's not just not just a vulnerability in your product. If one of those is compromised, it could compromise our pipelines. And we have a bunch of very sensitive API keys in those and stuff like that. So we, yeah. we have detection like Package Hunter is supposed to detect that, but we've seen we've seen 
like someone who is aware, someone who's targeting us could could evade package hunter potentially, just detect it and yeah, and yeah. fire in other environments that are not CI or something like that. We've seen we've seen the opposite actually. There was a a Rust package that was malware that fired only in C in GitLab CI CD. It was targeting someone using GitLab. So so that's you know that's kind of stuff. that's like the Volkswagen cars that detected they were being tested and didn't emit as much CO two. <laughs> it's um, it's, a, it's the same sort of situation. I I tried to find um I tried to find uh. I came across this and like a little while ago, but back in the day, like graphics cards would op run special optimizations based on the executable being called Quake. Yes, exe. They were in I don't remember three DS Mark or whatever. Right, I guess, and I don't remember. I was trying to, I was trying to reference it earlier. I couldn't find, couldn't even find any reference. Yeah. I guess it's being trying. To, uh, I don't know why I couldn't find it, but yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, and yeah, that's a good point. Like left pad is an extreme case, uh, because it's so silly. Like yeah, what but it actually does. So for... many sure. yeah. packages. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's worth us being aware of just the cost of bringing in dependencies it needs to continue to be a conversation in MRs. Uh, yeah. But I think like, to me, the cost of re-implementing sometimes it's really really low like because if a third party if a third party library has a lot of dependencies has some yellow to red flags that we're concerned about and we really just need this function but it's mit license i'm kind of like let's just copy and paste the code especially if there's not really any sign that the code will change if it is just padding spaces to the left of the string that algorithm is probably not going to change uh yeah, but there's those those situations where, especially if you just get if you're getting closer to the like pure algorithm side, that's like yes, this makes sense. Let's just own this and not deal with dependencies because then the yeah. fact that this thing will change is very unlikely. But yeah, there's a pro there's a lot that's going on, so it's it's a it's good to bring up the discussion at MRs, and I think uh, that's the main takeaway that I hope most of our code people doing code review can feel empowered to do is just starting the discussion based on that feeling of like, uh, let's just start talking about it then and not just, not just stuff it and feel like, well, I guess, you know, I guess this was already talked about. So we're just going to keep going. And, um, yeah, I, I, I hope that does get to happen. Um, got another one million dollar question on this kind of um kind of closing up on this. So we've just been speaking about what kind of issues would justify a third party library and what kind of issues we rather solve ourselves. Let's move ahead one more step and let's imagine for a second that we are working on a problem which absolutely requires a third party library because it's just too complex or whatever it might be. But yeah. what I found myself in to be quite open is I'll be searching for somebody to solve the problem for me and I'll be finding 18 different libraries. What kind mm. of red or yellow flags are we thinking about that actually might help us finding a good one? Because as far as I know, there's not a lot of standard. There's also kind of gut feeling like um, yes, we use it exists activity these kind of things like but these are all super vague in a way. Yep, uh, I added a link in the agenda just now. We're trying it. There's a project. It's been going on for a while. This is not ready yet, but there's a MR dependency review bot project that's going on. That would when you add something that kind of fetches the metadata and builds a trust score about. Each vulnerability, uh, each vulnerability, <laughs> each dependency. Um, there's also, if you want something a little more formal, I have to find the link. Give me one second. Um, this is this is beautiful. Wow, a trust score with the quantifying criticality algorithm could be used here. This is this is this is really cool. And Open okay. SSF. Oh, thing. 
Um, um, open I, SSF. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I was going to say, we've been talking about security issues without maybe talking about specific security issues. Maybe the rest of this, maybe this is just a private recording in general. I think we did mention, hey, if people were wanting to attack us, they could skirting around packets. Uh, or do you think that this Yeah, I, well, I don't think that was uh, anything new to anyone who was trying to attack us. Okay. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm debating in the yeah, back of my head. I'm fine. So I have a I have a confidential issue that I would uh it's somewhat relevant and interesting to share. Um I would love to get your all thoughts on it. Um so I might just pause the recording then on that on that case. But is there something yeah. more that you want to bring up? I was I was wanting to share my screen on this dependency review bot, but I, I won't share it right now. Is there something that yeah you wanted to highlight? Uh, open SF, which is uh, open source software foundation, I think. <laughs> Uh, they have a another, and I am pretty sure the bot actually, the bot I mentioned leverages that, but uh, they have this core card project and a bunch of criteria is basically to to look at the the health and of the project. And they have like all the things that we kind of uh, that our gut feelings. They they have this this list, and you kind of go through the entire thing and, and projects that check all the boxes will be extremely rare, but just everything everything they check just adds to your confidence. So the, the list looks like, uh, just, uh, yeah, do they, like basically they're, they're CI and just review everything, best practices. Could, do they even do code review? Like look at their PRs and it's just, is it just one person commit and merge and, are, is there any review going on? Do they have contributors? What yeah. do their CI workflow? Do they do fuzzing? Was the license, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This so is have this... so cool. Uh, yeah, this is like really, really cool. Um, I wonder how, how we would score. <laughs> um, yeah. I think we would score well. Also, I, there's something, it's kind of a, yeah, we probably would, to be honest, because we have a lot of uh, extremely good practices. Mm -hmm. And one thing, one thing that many people, the first, one thing that people tend to think is a red flag, but could be a green one is existing vulnerabilities that were well, patched vulnerabilities. But when you go in the repository and like, let's say on GitHub, they have the security tab and you have the advisories. If they see that they never had any security advisory, they're like, hey, yay, this is safe. But actually, no, this is just, they don't disclose security issues. Yeah. yeah. So, so if if there's a list of some issues, this is not a red flag for me. This is, oh, cool. They are transparent about their security issues. And you can actually see how the security issue was handled. How did they, like, how was it reported to them? Do they even have a process to report security issues? I don't, I don't mean a bug bounty program. I don't expect that of a random open source dependency, but I want a process to reach out to that person. And so having disclosed security issues for me is a huge green flag, actually. Yeah. And one of the biggest, like, if you have the list of CVs every year, one of the companies that has the largest amount of CVs is GitLab. So, you know, it's just because we're very transparent and we request CV even for the smallest, tiniest, silly security issue. But we believe that every single security issue should be, should have an advisory and then our users can decide themselves if it's, if it justifies an upgrade or not, instead of hiding them. That's awesome. But yeah. Can I ask, okay. can I ask you a naive question about the CVs? Um, yeah, sure. Do we request a CVE when one of our dependencies, like does does do we inherit all the the amount of CVEs? Or uh, do, do we have to? We request another CVE if if the vulnerability in the package was exploitable in GitLab. Got it. Yep, that makes sense. Okay, that's usually our process. Got it. Like if 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 there was a issue with reading files in, in Rails, and we had to upgrade Rails and release a new GitLab version. Because of that, we would issue a CV on top of it. Got it. Got it. Okay. 
um heading on that note so today i learned that um getting a cv number for a security issue is completely optional and nothing more than an agreement like it oh it's more than optional it it depends on if basically it's the uh, the owner of the project that requests the cv so it's all in good faith <laughs> yeah uh and then if the owner of the so, so this there are some politics involved so there first the owner of the code should request the cv if they don't the finder of the security issue could reach out to the miter which is the organizations but if the owner of the code is what we call a cna a cv numbering authority like gitlab emits cv numbers we we are a cna because we can like uh, open source projects hosted on GitLab can request CVE numbers and we, we kind of create that for them. You cannot request a CVE for a project owned by a CNA. <laughs> so, so let's pick a CNA at random, GitHub. If you find a security issue in GitHub and they fix it, but don't announce it, you, like if you request it for them, it will be denied because they are a CNA. And the same would be true for us, correct? For GitLab, yeah, yeah. If we decided, like, no, this security issue remains secret, uh, we have that. <laughs> but, oh, oh, okay, but the if we're taking the the authorization parts aside, if I do have a library um, with a massive security loophole, and you find it, I can I as the alpha cannot stop you from reporting it. So sooner no. or later, it, it probably go out. Okay, at least. However, you need uh, you need a reporter who who cares enough to do that. Fair point. Yeah, and, and I'll be very transparent. I have it was a fairly minor issue, but I have reported a security issue. It was a denial of service in the HTTP in the gem for HTTP requests called X XCon, which is fairly popular, and they fixed it, and the process was fine, but they didn't request a CVE, so nobody who runs dependency scan knows that they need to upgrade. And they don't know that their website could go down with a single request. But I was like, requesting a CV is kind of a pain in the butt. So I was like, this is your job, man. <laughs> I, did, I did my part. <laughs> Fair point. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. so yeah, if it was like RC or whatever, I, I would have pushed a little more. But so yeah, this is all standing on the shoulders of goodwill people. This conversation. Not make me sleep any better, but oh, thanks for the insight. Nobody <laughs> sleeps on the security team. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe gotcha. uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe this uh, is a says something positive about the human spirit. We've made it this far. Oh, no, yeah. I mean, it just it, it keeps in yeah, the, the. That's like yeah. open source software in general. Nobody has to do that. Yeah, and. We're all here. <laughs> I do appreciate like GitLab really does lead the charge in this. They're one of the most hacker ethic, share everything as much as possible. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Which is really cool. And um, I hope it inspires more organizations and maintainers to do the same. Uh, because yeah, there's there's a lot of, that's a lot of positivity that can be done. Um, and there's a lot of people that do want to do the right thing. And that's a, a, that's a good thing. Um, I'd love to share, uh, talking about dependencies, I'd love to share this issue that we've been wrestling with, which is kind of related to code review, but kind of not, but is very related to the discussion about dependencies we were just talking about. Um, but this is a confidential issue. So I'm going to pause the recording. Is everyone okay with that? Uh, okay, I'm pausing the So I'm going to uh, resume the recording and I'm going to just share our one of the conclusions was I was asking about a library that we struggle with that has um, commonly recurring issues. And uh, if there's something we're using that we don't totally trust and or that is proven to be a little flaky from a security perspective, um, from the front end, you could actually use, there's some means of being able to just put this in a little sandbox uh, specifically with this sandbox attribute on an iframe 
And um, I like that idea of we're able to use dependencies, but we're taking extra precautions. We're future we're future proofing ourselves because we we don't want to. Um, we realize that there's inherent risk with um, the way this dependency does things. And as you said, anything that renders runs user input is a is a pretty big red flag of we probably want to sandbox this thing. I, I I think I'll share I'll add this in the slides as well, but you know even sanitizers, like we say, oh we run a sanitizer, but even that bugs happen. Uh, I saw a talk uh, someone gave recently, he was fuzzing sanitizers. He basically took a very, very large list of weird HTML input, usually like lists of XSS payloads or whatever. He had thousands of those. And then he modified a, a fuzzer like AFL to to run on um, like DOM Purify and libraries like that, but not just JavaScript, a bunch of languages. There was one for Java, and I believe he did it for HTML server sanitizer on in Ruby as well. And he just, like, yeah, I think he had a computer running those things, and he just let it go for a week and a half or something, and then he gets a notification, and then, oh, this thing is not sanitized, and he has like the most massive HTML payload, and then he, he works it and figures out what's the minimal thing, and the sanitizer reads parses the, the HTML and thinks, uh, I don't know, this is a list with an embedded comment or whatever, but the browser parses that and actually does not parse in the same order and sees a script right, right. tag instead. And wow. so that was supposed to be text, but it's actually parsed as a tag. So, so that sort of stuff can happen. And so even sanitizers, I mean, at some point you have to kind of trust someone, <laughs> but, but if we can even the sandbox at this point if you want to bypass that you need like a bug in yeah. the browser that way those do exist but we're really making it so much more difficult and also when there's a bug in the html sanitizer we have to update a library and ship a new release when there's a bug in the browser which is one very rare and two the browser is updated everyone's browser updates automatically and we don't have to ship any release. <laughs> so there, yeah, there's yeah. that aspect as well. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. Um, that's, uh, that's, I, I know that happens and it always, it always scares me when I realize the arms race that security is. And then when you have the robots yeah. just pointing at each other and just going on to infinitum of that's not a word. Oh yeah, fuzzing. Yeah. Fuzzing is uh, <laughs> that's, that's limitless. Yeah, that's what absolutely wild. I I do like the idea, and I think generally as a culture, bringing this back to code review of being defensive sounds like a really necessary security tactic of like just knowing even this this works today, but we just also don't know like issues it may have in the future or now. So the whatever steps we can take to limit the blast radius of when things go wrong is yeah. um, a really good culture right. we need to be promoting and asking. As, and assume something. there will be a vulnerability. Basically. Yeah. And yeah. how do we prepare for that? Yeah, that's cool. Um, thanks, thanks for letting me uh, poke, poke at you so much and, and getting you to, to spill your security guts knowledge at the table um yeah is there anything else that we wanted to to, to dive into here i guess there's a server side equivalent to those sandbox mechanisms it's so much more complicated but um like when there's something we don't trust and that's something we're trying to to look into for we, we thought about that when we ran the uh, exif tool on our uh images that are uh, uploaded and stuff like that uh you can these are words i never pronounce and only read but you know the the change root tool truth <laughs> oh. uh, you can can you can kind of change you, you could execute you, you move you copy the executable in the place and you 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 create a user 
that has only access to, I don't know, it's like some sort of directory inside your, your temp files or whatever. So if there's ever an exploit in that and they get file and command execution on the system, they are running as a user that has access to nothing. Mm. Sort of like something in a container, like our runners. Like you have command execution by design on our runners and this is not a security issue. So because of the way it's designed. So some of our actions, once again, where we process user input, when we process uploads, when we process project imports, uh, where we had a lot of security issues, if those could happen inside an environment that we don't care if it's compromised, basically, that's mm -hmm. really, and this makes the architecture a lot harder, especially uh, with our monolith. This is where kind of microservices or whatever you want to call them shine, I guess. It's easy to just put that workflow inside of another machine and there we go. <laughs> like we don't compromise our host. But yeah, this is uh, this is the iframe sandbox of the service side. <laughs> right, right. That's interesting. Um, yeah, it makes sense from a microservices perspective. And I can see that being really challenging from the monolithic perspective of having to do yeah, yeah, like yeah. user organization of uh but that's interesting um and that makes sense though uh my the microservice approach sounds easy sounds way easier <laughs> than spinning up processes for some reason like even though there's probably a lot more going on it sounds easier than spinning off processes yeah <laughs> yeah that's funny um cool well for the last bit uh, we usually pair up on an MR review, but we only have like 10 minutes left. Does anyone have like a really small MR that or something of that nature that they'd wanna want to present to the offering of the, the code review gods? I'm gonna take that as a maybe next time. <laughs> Cool. Well, this was such a fascinating I, discussion. I added a link to a, a presentation in the, the agenda. Awesome. Great. Highly recommend watching it. It yeah. will open your eyes if you're not uh, familiar with that. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So this is, uh, I'll add this link also to the, um, the recording description, but this is such a fascinating discussion. I think security is such a great, important these quality attributes are hopefully the things we're talking about in code review, at least in a collaborative way of like, how are we going to maintain this in the long run? What's the performance of this going to be like in the long run? And security is a big one as well. That I think for all code reviewers, hopefully a big takeaway isn't just that we hyper-focus on the functional bit of what we're looking at, but we have to look at all the quality attributes here. And security is a um, security and performance tend to be at odds with all sorts of other <laughs> quality attributes. Um, cool. Well, thanks. Appreciate appreciate you you hopping on and, and contributing so much to the conversation, Dominic and everybody else. I will bid you all adieu and have a great rest of the day. Adios.